We're going to pick up the afternoon discussion with quick 30 minutes on analgesia and procedural sedation. We'll go through some of the analgesics. We'll talk a little bit about procedural sedation and your choices there and sort of bring some things that I think are kind of important stuff that are often forgotten about some of the non-opiates, and we'll get there. All right. Pain, the fifth vital sign. How many of you remember that whole campaign? Kind of irritated me, right, the Joint Commission. Pain is the fifth vital sign. We already had five at that time, if you counted pulse ox, which irritated me. So you needed to really make sure that pain was the sixth vital sign. Um, that kind of irritated me. And then, you know, CMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, said they were going to document whether you had addressed pain in a meaningful way and they wanted pain scores to come down. That Just the mention of CMS irritates me because their name is the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. If you don't know how many M's you have in your name, CMS versus CMMS, then how could you possibly audit a chart in a meaningful way? Um, having noted all of that, then you overlay on top of it the whole opiate epidemic, and this gets people all riled up, and so we'll talk about it all to a certain degree. This is wildly polarizing, and I'm sure there'll be disagreements among us and in the room. Anyway, pain, common reason for people to come to the emergency department. It should be addressed. That doesn't always mean opiates. Emtala. There are actually Emtala suits where someone said, my acute condition was not stabilized, and that acute condition was pain. So in our courts, and we all know this is sort of, you know, uh, happens at state by state levels, but Emtala has by tort determined pain to be an emergency medical condition. Effective early pain relief, so if someone gives a pain score of, you know, 8, 9, 10 out of 10 um, in their triage vitals, you want to do something about that. How many of you have had patients refuse meds? That's just fine. All you have to do to defend yourself in those situations is pain control offered and refused. And I've seen lots of patients refuse pain meds over the time, even non-narcotics. They're like, no, it's not that bad, doctor. I, I'm fine just as I am. Uh, but if you are going to manage pain and they want pain management, you should do it earlier rather than later. Your goal is to get it down, you know, a substantial, meaningful amount, which is like by at least a third, a half would be better. Oligoanalgesia. So the literature describing under-treatment of pain in the emergency department is a stack of papers from the stage to about where my hand is. It is robust. It covers a variety of conditions from fractures to sickle cell to all kinds of things. That literature, so the literature surrounding oligoanalgesia is way more compelling than the literature right here saying that treatment of pain in the emergency department causes downstream problems. There's the literature right there, and those papers have been widely challenged. Um, now, the opiate epidemic is real, but is largely not caused by us in the emergency department. Yes, it's true, we are frequent prescribers, but of small amounts. Um, in terms of the real causes, you know, there are multiple states' attorneys that are pursuing the appropriate people for mismarketing and spreading out, and then there are the pill-pushing clinics that have been closing and things like that. There were a lot of factors that came together to create this epidemic, um, but the temptation, I think, to point fingers at us should be, you know, acknowledged, but also recognized for the problems with it, and the recognition of oligoanalgesia, which has far more evidence to talk about it, should also be recognized. The idea that you're going to be an opiate-free emergency department, I think, is nuts. People come with severe pain, and when they have severe pain, it should get managed. I've had about 30 fractures in my life. Many of you are probably thinking, and he deserves 40. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, there are things that really hurt, and there's no need for them to suffer if we can manage their pain successfully. Beware the trap of undertreating pain with judgmental or pejorative thoughts. There's no test for it. I generally assume patients are truthful about it. We get a lot of people saying, well, that sickler, his vitals are totally normal. He can't be in pain. Uh, that's the way chronic pain is. They have normal vital signs. That's to be expected. I always like to compare when we talk about sickle cell, asthma. When patients come in with asthma, recurrent, brittle asthma, been in the emergency department three times in the last month, we don't look at them and say, damn oxygen seeker. Don't give him any oxygen. Not compliant with his medication regimen. And I think we should try and remember the same thing about other chronic, serious, painful conditions like sickle cell 
And having sort of a, a, a pain protocol for them, I think, is very useful and narrows the variation in, chair, in care. Document pain scales important before and after. Consider asking about pain in every patient encounter. I frequently ask them, what works for you? I find that inf answer informative. Many times they'll say, I've never had a pain medication. That's informative. Um, when they certainly say, dilaudid four milligrams is what works for me, that's informative. That's, that's the time to check their PDMP and see what's been going on with them. And they might have a very good reason. As I say, a sickle cell patient that says four milligrams of dilaudid orally is what works for me, that's a totally reasonable response. That might be what works for them. Um, and so I think we should be aggressive about identifying and treating it. There are lots of non-pharmacologic analgesic measures you can do, distraction, headphones, toys, DVDs, that's all in the peds world they do that. Acupuncture, I'm not going to start doing that in the emergency department. There have been weird papers about acupressure of the ear and hip fractures in pre-hospital care. Seem to work. I'm, all, I'm all, all ears for any of these. Vibration, how many of you have the little buzzy toy for peds IV starts? Anyone, any buzzies out there? There's just a couple. Pretty good literature supporting those. Don't forget ice, elevation, splinting, all things that mitigate pain. And then there's local and topicals. We've already talked about Salon Pa and the 4% lidocaine patches and the TENS units. Then there's uh, regional sort of pain. Digital and regional blocks are very useful things to do when, if you're familiar with them. Intraarticular injections for things like shoulder pain, shoulder uh, dislocations, things like that. I think you have to use these all with judgment, but there are lots of strategies and opiate alternatives out there. The analgesic ladder for adults, and you can see you don't give opiates until you're in step two, and, uh, and then at step three you go up, and this all has to do with route and dose and things like that. Route of administration. For many patients in the emergency room who aren't going to get an IV, we want something that's either topical or PO. And if we're going to have to go stronger than that, then it's going to be IM, generally speaking. And IM is fine, but you only like to do that once, right? You don't want to be giving someone serial IM shots in the emergency department. If you're anticipating that you might need to do this again, then it's probably better to start an IV. Think about the desired onset and the duration, the contraindications and the side effects of what you're choosing and dose appropriately. The forgotten effective pain med. So acetaminophen is a pretty good pain med. If you give a large enough dose and you give it at the right intervals, you can get pretty good control with acetaminophen for a lot of things. Um, it um, comes in liquid pill and rectal forms. The IV form, how many of you have the IV form in your emergency department or where you work? It's very expensive. In fact, at Stony Brook, we were using so much of it, they finally put the kibosh on it and said, stop using the IV acetaminophen when there are other alternatives. Effective dose is 15 mg per kg, but there's lots of literature saying you can go higher. The pharmacist and your program, your fail-safe on your uh, order entry will often stop you from going higher, higher but you can. Maximum 24-hour daily dose, 4 grams per the FDA, lasts 4 to 6 hours. But totally reasonable thing to do as a starting point for less acute, less severe pain. NSAIDs. I find a lot of people throw NSAIDs around willy-nilly without asking, have you had GI bleed? Do you have any renal compromise or any renal history? Without sort of looking at what their, the potential downsides of them. Remember that for all NSAIDs, and we'll, we'll use ibuprofen as our model drug, right? The sort of, for an adult, sort of the lower dose is 400 and the upper dose is 800. Why are there two plateaus? The analgesic plateau is the lower one. If it's a, just a pure painful condition without inflammation, say an ankle sprain, there's no need to go to 600 or 800 or Motrin you're, or ibuprofen. You're giving treatment for pain. The ceiling, the analgesic ceiling is 400. If they have a, an inflammatory condition, then you go up to 800. And if you were to go to 1,000 of ibuprofen, do you get more anti-inflammatory effect? Yes, you do, but the side effect profile becomes unacceptable. So for all NSAIDs across the whole class, the analgesic ceiling is about half what the anti-inflammatory ceiling is. And in, across the class, the anti-inflammatory ceiling is bounded largely by side effects, renal, GI, and other. Okay, 
So be aware of that. I find a lot of people prescribing NSAIDs willy-nilly when they really should have thought. You know, you got a patient who's got, if you were to query their record, they've got, you know, stage three renal disease. Eh, probably not the greatest time to be going with an NSAID. You got a history of GI bleeding, think about it. Remember that the GI bleeding has a lot to do with not just the drug you chose, but the dose and the duration. And that's why you've all seen people on 81 milligrams of aspirin long term who've had a GI bleed. That's because they're an old patient where the, the dose is small, but the duration is forever. And so even at a low dose, if the duration is forever, you can get side effects like GI bleeding. They looked in the, in the country of England at all of their perfed ulcers, free air. I love this paper. Said, you perfed your stomach. You've got free air under the diaphragm. Half of them were temporally related to new or increased NSAID dosing. Almost half of the cost of NSAIDs is for the complications related to NSAIDs. Rarely that's a perforation, but GI bleeding is common. And where does that cost come in? People needing transfusions. So NSAIDs have substantial side effects. They're not nearly as safe as acetaminophen. Aspirin, another forgotten NSAID, similar things. Routine adult doses for pain, 325 to 650, last two to four hours. Again, same side effects. We said the NSAIDs are a class. You can give enteric coated, which will decrease it a little bit. And then avoid in children with viral illnesses because you're worried about Rye syndrome. So we've already been talking about ibuprofen a little bit. There's the four and the 800 milligrams, 400 for pure pain, 600, 800 if you think there's an inflammatory process. Let's say they have gout and you're gonna give an NSAID. Is gout an inflammatory process? Yes. So you might push the boundaries a little bit more. You might be going with naproxen, 500 in that case, because you've got an inflammatory condition that you're trying to back the inflammation down. But understanding the two ceilings, the analgesic ceiling and the anti-inflammatory ceiling in terms of how you dose them is quite important. Ketorolac, the only parenteral NSAID in the United States, is that true elsewhere in the world? Is it that hard to grind up aspirin and put it in solution and give aspirin IV? No, all across Europe you can give aspirin IV. We apparently lack the technology in the United States to grind up aspirin and put it in solution so you could give IV aspirin. Apparently, you'd have to drill in the Alaskan National Wildlife Refuge for the special solvent or something, and we just can't do it in the US. But um, this is mostly about patent protection and marketing and big pharma and things like that. But Ketorolac is the only one. What do we know about Ketorolac? Who remembers the days when you could give 60 IV? I do. What happened? Now you can't do it, why? Because single doses of 60 IV have resulted in renal failure. Not temporary renal failure, the oops, let me introduce you to your local dialysis center kind of renal failure. So you have to be aware of that. So they drop the dose, the highest dose down to 30. If you're seeing an oldster, you know, a 70 year old with a painful condition and you wanna give Ketorolac, you probably ought to drop down to 15. There are even K 15 milligrams IV. And lots of times your pharmacist, how many of you have a, a, an order entry thing where your pharmacist has, the, they have automatic safeties on it and will back you down on your Ketorolac? Anyone got that? We have it at Stony Brook. That's pretty well founded. Those things exist for a reason. These problems have been well documented. There have been single doses of um, NSAID in kids with renal failure. Even a kid with great renal function and normal health beforehand. So you have to be aware of this. Dosed with care. Um, and then the other problem with, with NSAIDs is some people just don't get much pain relief from them. Some people get great pain relief. How many of you have given, they always say to you that if you gave an NSAID for say a kidney stone, that that shouldn't work for an hour or two, but the patient has almost immediate pain relief. You might say, well, that's a natural history. Some kidney stones just get better with nothing. But I swear to God that I've seen patients that where I believe that the administration of the NSAID resulted in almost immediate pain relief for them, and I've seen people, people where it didn't. So I think it works in some of these situations. Where should you particularly go for NSAIDs? When it's a prostaglandin-mediated pain syndrome. What are the prostaglandin-mediated pain syndromes? Biliary colic, 
renal colic, and menstrual cramping, or uterine cramping of any cause. It doesn't have to be menstrual. But all of those pain syndromes are prostaglandin-mediated, and so an NSAID, which gets at the root cause of the pain, would be a preferable choice in those settings. All right, opiates. The epidemic is real. Yes, the epidemic was caused by a lot of factors, not just people prescribing. There were pill pushers. There was flooding of the market. There was irresponsible big pharma houses. There was all kinds of stuff involved in this. Yes, there were a lot of deaths. A lot of those deaths happened when the supply dried up, dried up and they went, started getting stuff on the street that was fentanyl tainted or car fentanyl tainted. We had a guy who came in with an overdose, took like almost 12 milligrams, I think, of Narcan to reverse him. He went on to get heroin-induced pulmonary edema that was from fentanyl, probably. And the next day or two days after, his girlfriend came in, and she also took four milligrams or five milligrams of Narcan to reverse. And so it occurred to us, I wonder if it's car fentanyl, right, the even more potent than fentanyl version. And I remember we asked her, you know, was it fentanyl? Was it China White? Could it have been car fentanyl? And I love this answer. I love it when patients say stuff where you're like, she goes, well, it was in the glove compartment. That doesn't make it car fentanyl, the fact that you had to get it out of the car. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we, the car fentanyl's out there, and it's a, you know, it's a veterinarian uh, extra strength fentanyl version, so with powerful, powerful respiratory depression. So for those of you who are seeing some of these overdoses, remember you might need high doses of Narcan to reverse them. Uh, alternatives certainly should be emphasized, and we've touched a little bit on that, but when a patient has severe pain um, and they're not refusing pain meds, oftentimes opiates are where, you're, where you'll end up in the emergency department. This does not, again, necessarily pin you down or require that you give opiates at discharge. We'll talk about that in a moment. IV opiates for severe pain, titrate dosing and effic efficacy. Best agents for acute pain are fentanyl. We like fentanyl because it doesn't have any histamine release. Remember all of the fentanyl family, fentanyl, sufentanyl, carfentanyl, none of them have any histamine release. So you won't get that warm, itchy arm. They're relatively vital sign neutral. That's another reason we like them. They're relatively short duration and titratable, so they're good for abdominal pain where a surgeon might be coming to evaluate them an hour later. All reasons to do it. Morphine, good old-fashioned morphine. Remember, you got to write out morphine sulfate. You can't write MS four milligrams anymore. And hydromorphone or Dilaudid. Those are sort of the severe pain optimals. The, when you have a patient that says, this opiate worked for me and the other one didn't, what does that mean? It means they're trying to help you. Let me give you one of the other axioms across the opiate class. No opiate is superior to any other opiate given in equipotent doses for pain control across a population. So if I took 200 people and asked which opiates work, they're in equipotent doses, they'd all be the same. However, on an individual basis, there are wide variations in opiate response. So when a patient tells you, I had fentanyl and I didn't like it, and it doesn't work for me, you should trust them and choose a different opiate. When they say, I had Dilaudid and it worked well for me in a, you know, when I had my appendicitis or my back surgery, you should believe them and maybe choose that. And so there's wide variation on individuals. Remember the, oh, the receptors, mu, kappa, delta, right? There's the three receptors in each receptor. There's three or four subtypes. So there's wide genetic variation in terms of what works. They even have varying abilities to metabolize them. And so when your patients have had some exposures to opiates and tell you which one works, don't take that as an indictment of them. Take that as assistance well intended to help you choose something that will work. Codeine and tramadol. There are patients for which they work. And if they're on them and they say they work, I'm fine to use them. But in general, if you don't know anything about the patient, codeine and tramadol you should reserve for your enemies and people you really dislike. Because in head-to-head -head trials, codeine has the worst side effect profile of any opiate, the most nausea and vomiting, and the least efficacy of any opiate, head-to-head, -head, uh, acetaminophen whips it. Head-to-head, -head, acetaminophen and codeine in blinded studies, hard to blind them because half the patients in one half of the trial are puking, but head-to-head, -head, they can't be told apart. Same with tramadol. Head-to-head -head with Tylenol, 
Tylenol whips it. If they say it works for them, I'm fine. But would I choose them in a patient who never had them before, who I thought needed pain control? Not unless I was really cornered in that box. All right, parenteral dosing, morphine, the dose is 0.1 to 0.2 per kilo. That means four milligrams for a 70 kilogram adult is a really low dose. I see residents asking for two. I'm like, why don't you just go over and spit on them? Two milligrams of morphine for a, you know, an 80 kilogram adult. I'm like, all right, is it symbolic you're looking for? Um, but if you really want to treat pain, you should go higher. It's okay to start at four or six and titrate up. That's fine. But understand that four is an underdosing of most adults. Dilaudid, five to 10 times as potent, start at one milligram. I've seen people drop the two milligram bomb on someone and then they're in there bagging them a little later. That's a mistake. Don't give someone two milligrams of Dilaudid and send them to CT scan because they might come back not breathing. So you gotta watch the Dilaudid, it's more potent. And same thing on your order entry, lots of times it'll flag you and say for the patient, you got a little old lady from the nursing home, 55 kilograms, and you order a milligram of Dilaudid, that's too much. And it'll peg you down, which is totally fine. I appreciate those. Or there's so many order entry things that are constant irritants to me that I, you know, that make my head want to explode. This is not one of those places. When they catch me and remind me that this is a little old lady and one might be too much, I'm like, all right, thanks, 0.5. And then fentanyl, 50 to 100 mics. And you can titrate that up. Remember that if you're giving fentanyl for severe pain, you may, even if it works when you first give it at 100, say you gave 100 mics and it worked great, that's fine, but you may have to be back there doing it again in a half hour. It doesn't have a prolonged duration. Adjuncts, how many of you give the Zofran automatically? I used to. Remember we used to give the, the Phenergan automatically? I used to. There have been a, several papers recently that says it's not opiate sparing and it doesn't increase the potency. That it do, and it doesn't stop the vomiting. So, you know, I know my nurses really hate it when I give someone opiates and they vomit, and so they, there's kind of a little push to go ahead and give them some Zofran with it. But the literature suggests it doesn't really work that way, and so if they develop nausea, chase with the uh, Zofran, but don't give it automatically. It just adds expense, and lots of patients are gonna tolerate it just fine. Okay. In terms of an overview, maybe needed to control pain, opiates are, need to caution patients who are going home on them regarding driving and operating machinery and document that they got that because otherwise you can have some blowback in that regard. Specific orals, hydrocodone, oxycodone, you can see the data on them here. They both come as elixirs, um, although I rarely prescribe in, in doses that are needed for that for peds. Um, except in a few situations, fractures being one of them. And you'll find them, one of the things you have to be careful about when you're prescribing these is what your pharmacies often carry. So you might think it's a big person, they got bad pain, I want to give the seven and a half, 325. And what do you find out? Pharmacy doesn't carry it. And so in New York, where we have to e-prescribe everything and they don't carry it, that's a royal pain in the butt. So now I have to get back into the whole system with the fingerprint, undo it, to make that prescription go away and then redo it. And so pay attention, learn a little bit about what the pharmacies carry in your area so you can be prescribing appropriately. How many of you are e-prescribing um, a lot in your world? For those of you who aren't, it's coming. There are some good things about it in terms of le you know, less tampering with your prescriptions and things. There are some really bad things about it. How much does the cost of a drug A at pharmacies one, two, three, and four vary by? up to tenfold. So with e-prescribing, where the, the patient can't take the prescription to another pharmacy, it may result in pretty substantial financial injury to them because they now can't shop their local pharmacies for the cheapest availability of the drug. Fentanyl, love fentanyl for all kinds of things. Atomized delivery, we were talking about that, the, you know, the localized tonsil thing should be given viscous lidocaine. Have any of you ever tried nebbing some fentanyl to someone with a terrible, terrible sore throat? Works great. Just put 25. Now, of course, anytime you want to neb anything that they don't think is a nebbable drug, you know, the nebulization police are alerted. 
and they'll come to find out what you're doing to divert it. But you can nebulize fentanyl. I've done it several times. My, my thing for the person who's, I just can't swallow, I have to have some relief, you know, take my tonsils out right now. Obviously, that's not happening. Um, I'll nab them some fentanyl and a little bit of 1% lidocaine with epi. Tonsils be gone. Now they can swallow. And then ketamine, um, love ketamine, but obviously ketamine is, you know, uh, you can use it in sub-dissociative doses for pain. This is done mostly in cancer patients. Many in the room may not have familiarity with using sub-dissociative doses of ketamine for pain, 0.2 to 0.3 per kilo. I'll do it. It's definitely opiate sparing. There's scattered literature on it. Um, you want to have a protocol in place in your emergency department, if you're working in an emergency department or wherever you're working, that, that includes sub-dissociative stuff before you go there. Um, you can have some bizarre reactions with sub-dissociative ketamine. And so if you, you know, I think it's really mostly for ED usage. It's often used in patients with, in a hospice setting with chronic pan cancer pain, things like that. But it is something to be aware of. I've had great success with it with some cancer patients at Stony Brook where I'm having trouble controlling their pain and their vital signs are already wishy-washy. Um, and ketamine sub-dissociative dose solved the problem. Remember, that's different from procedural sedation. Right? This is sub-dissociative dose. If you're going to do the procedural sedation thing, which is one to two per kilo, now they've got to be monitored up and all that other stuff. Nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide available to you? Not many places. We used to have it at LA County when I was there. We don't have it at Stony Brook. The big problem was the, the big canisters disappeared. <laughs> then you'd find out there's a party at someone's house. Yeah. Um, so you gotta, you know, you gotta make sure it's safely managed and that it's not getting used in inappropriate ways. 50-50 uh, works better. Some of the models out there have 70-30, um, but 50-50 um, I think works best by, and is quite a bit better. Um, you have to be aware in using it in someone who needs oxygen, right? If you're gonna give them not enough oxygen, that's a problem. And avoid enclosed head injuries altered level of consciousness, psychiatric patients, pneumothorax, um, bowel obstructions, all those kinds of places are places where you don't want to be using a gas that might get larger in a confined space. All right, so you're going to let them go. Earlier I was talking about giving someone six tabs of, you know, whatever it is that you like, Vicodin, Oxycodone or something, so they don't need to bounce back. And some of you rightly pinned me on your feedback saying, that's pretty cavalier, granted. Um, what I should have said in a more correct way is I'd like them to be able to have adequate pain control so that they don't need to seek another visit from another care provider if I could meet those needs on the first pass. There have been a couple studies that asked people with fractured ankles sent home, given, a, given 20 tabs of, you pick it, one of those, you know, hydrocodone, oxycodone, whatever. How many did they take? It's interesting. The number in those studies, those are kind of, I find those interesting studies. Eight to ten is about what they take. As a consequence of that, I've backed down. I used to prescribe 20 often. I've now backed down to 12 is my number. 12 comes up on the menu. 12 is my number now because the literature says that'll cover the vast majority of people who have a short-term acute need for pain. If they have mild pain, they shouldn't get an opiate. If they have inflammatory pain, you should go up on the dose of NSAIDs. If they have moderate severe pain, you should consider opiates in small, small amounts, 8, 10, 12 tabs particularly if you really required opiates to control their pain in the emergency room. I see people writing for NSAIDs for people with fractures, and I know this happens a lot around the world. Again, as I mentioned, I've had over 30 fractures. I'm pretty sure Motrin doesn't work for that. Um, I sometimes see people writing for Motrin for people with fractures, like, put your finger on the table here, let me hit it with a framing hammer and shatter your distal phalanx. You tell me if Motrin will work for that. I don't think so. Um, and so, and these are things that hurt really when they go home and they're, they're in a splint or they're in a, you know, um, a cast and they're just aching like crazy. They can't sleep for days. And so I think they ought to be given some opiates for pain when that's the case. All right. Procedural sedation, totally different topic, right? Now we're talking about a monitored patient getting medication for the purposes of achieving some procedure. It ranges from mild sedation to deep sedation with dr uh, drugs like propofol. The Joint Commission, the JC, 
so irritating. I was at the hospital. I, I have to indulge myself. The JC was coming. I was in the jail ward, and the, the JC, and they said, came and said, we're the JC. And I said, excuse me? I'm an Irish Catholic kid from Boston. I looked at them, I said, I find your name religiously offensive. I'm not religious. I find your name religiously offensive. They were like, they were very confused. What are you talking about? I said, I have one JC. And that JC thinks they're the JC. <laughs> they were like, they were confused. They didn't get it. So I looked at them, I said, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> then they began to get it. <laughs> anyway, so you have strict requirements. You have to be credentialed for this. Don't do it if you're not credentialed. Choice of agent depends on the reasons of what you're doing. Know that sometimes it shouldn't be done. If you have someone who's an ASA category three or four, don't be, don't be overly proud and jam your way in there to do a procedure that's too dangerous. Call for help. Call anesthesia. Midazolam, muscle relaxant, and um, uh, amnestic, multiple formulations. Remember, it's water soluble, so you can give it IM, onset three to five minutes. Dose for sedation, 0, uh, 0.03 to 0.1 per kilo can cause respiratory depression, particularly if you're using it with fentanyl. Ketamine. I love ketamine. You have to have some experience with it. There you see the horse tranquilizer there. Um, it has both analgesia and sedation. Um, the patient will be fully dissociated if you give it one to two milligrams IV. If you're going to go IM, and I've done a lot of IM dissociative treatment for kids that didn't have an IV with a both bones fractures, things like that, and it's the, here it says four to five, but the general thing is 4.5 4 mgs per keg in Roundup. You can't be over dissociated. You either are dissociated or you're not. So you want to be over the boundary, uh, but not too far. I think it's a great drug for all kinds of things. Again, you want to have some experience with it. You want to be credentialed for it. Back in the days when we used to call this conscious sedation, ketamine didn't fit in because ketamine is unconscious non-sedation. They're not with it. It's unconscious non-sedation, really. Onset, one to three uh, minutes, duration longer. Downside, they sometimes get a little tachycardic. They talk about laryngospasm. I've been doing this with ketamine for almost 20 years now. I have not seen significant laryngospasm that needed me to deal with it yet. Um, no longer contracated in head trauma. Uh, in head trauma. No uh, co-medication needed. There is this stuff about using propofol with it, but you don't need to do that. Atomidate, which we've been using for uh, intubation for years, also looked at at a lower dose for procedural sedation at 0.1 to 0.2 per kilo. I don't like it because it causes some myoclonus. It's hard to do an IND of a big abscess when the leg is twitching around. Um, but some people like it, and it's got some favorable reports. If you're comfortable with it, I'm fine with that. Propofol, milk of amnesia. This will take them down hard and fast. You'd better have all of your intubation stuff ready to go and know what you're doing. There is no analgesia. No analgesia. So if they need pain control, you got to consider getting them some fentanyl when they're waking up or prior. Um, and you got to be aware of hypotension and respiratory depression with this drug. This is something that really requires the full meal deal with a team to do. Key to fall is when you mix them. There have been some recent papers that say there's no real advantage over ketamine alone. But this, got, this was, you know, there are four or five papers on this for those of you who love the half and half mixing of these. I don't love it. I don't do it anymore. There we go. Right on time. Who's up next? All of the drug doses in there are useful for you as a reference when you look back at it. If you have questions, I'm happy to deal with them later. Jan, you're up.